And so now it is up to the courts, our third branch of government to decide. The stakes, I think, could not be higher. The court must determine now whether greenhouse gas pollutants and their primary sources present an unreasonable risk of injury to public health and the environment, or do they not? You know, what began as a citizen's petition is now a citizen's lawsuit. everybody to another Climate Emergency Forum program. Today we welcome back Dan Galpern and Don Viviani of the Climate Protection and Restoration Initiative, or CPR Initiative for short. Today's program is titled The Legal Battle to Save the World, and it will provide an update on their petition to phase out greenhouse gas emissions which they submitted to the EPA on June 16th. In our last program called Saving the EPA from Itself, the EPA's rejection of the petition provided on September 14th and the reasons they gave for this rejection along with CPR initiatives plans were discussed. So now let me introduce Dan and Don. Dan Galpern is an environmental and climate attorney and the general counsel and executive director of CPR Initiative. Don Viviani is the former director of the Climate Policy Assessment Division at the EPA, a doctor of physical organic chemistry, as well as the president of the board of directors for CPR Initiative. So welcome back, Dan and Don. Dan, in your lawsuit against EPA, you are demanding that the U.S. EPA address the unreasonable risk from climate change. Can you give us the essential background and who is actually suing EPA and how did we get here? All right. Thank you very much, Charles, and good to be back with you and with Peter and Paul. The uh, lawsuit is by five individual petitioners, five individuals, and two organizations. Uh, these are the same set of people and organizations that petitioned EPA in June for the rulemaking in order to phase out a greenhouse gas pollution and their major sources, which are fossil fuels, within reach of United States law. So specifically, they include Don, Viviani, who is here with us today, who worked for EPA for over 32 years, and you already discussed a bit of his background. The renowned climate scientist, James Hansen, whom I've been representing as his legal and policy advisor for the past uh, 13 years. The atmospheric scientist, John Burks, a professor emeritus from the University of Colorado. Uh, well regarded in his field. The climate accountability analyst, Richard Heady, who's uh, most well known for his research into the uh, carbon majors and the degree to which they are responsible for uh, creating the climate crisis that we are attempting to confront in this action. Uh, the forensic psychiatrist and author, Lisa Van Susteren of Washington, D.C., Dr. Hansen's organization, Climate Science Awareness and Solutions, and uh, the public interest organization, Climate Protection and Restoration uh, Initiative. Again, these were the petitioners, and now they are the plaintiffs in this lawsuit. So how did we get here? The essential background is this. As you noted, we had filed a petition under Section 21 of the Toxic Substances Control Act demanding that EPA commence a rulemaking to address this horrific problem by imposing requirements 
to a phase out greenhouse gas uh, pollution within reach of uh, US law and its major sources, as I, as I noted. And the petition seeks to get at two uh, parts of the two main parts of this problem. Number one, we need to phase out continuing emissions. And number two, because we're already so overshot the safe level of atmospheric CO2 and methane and the other greenhouse gases, that the petition calls for a uh, imposition of responsibility or liability on the major polluters to actually remove or pay to remove for a significant portion of the overburden of CO2 and methane. So as you indicated, the agency actually rejected, denied our petition. And so that triggered a 60 day window in which we would either need to file a lawsuit in federal court to challenge that denial and to try to compel the rulemaking through judicial action or sleep on our rights. And so we did file that lawsuit on the 12th of November. But that wasn't the only response uh, that we have undertaken. And uh, if I can mention those two as well, because I think this is sort of a package proposal. Uh, the first is that we filed the Freedom of Information Act request, and we did that on November 7. And both our the complaint in our lawsuit and Freedom of Information Act request are on our and freely available to uh, viewers, to readers, uh, on our website at cprclimate.org. And here's the reason why we filed the Freedom of Information Act request. In its letter of denial, the agency actually stated as one of its reasons for rejecting our petition that it was doing enough already in this area under existing law and plan rules. But it was essentially a, a fully data-free assertion. And you would have expected them to at least have produced a spreadsheet that would summarize how they are seeking to get all emissions reductions because the Biden administration admits that it needs at least to get to net zero emissions by 2050. So how actually would they get there under existing law and plan rules? There was essentially nothing provided in the letter of rejection. So giving them the benefit of the doubt, we just assumed that they forgot to put in such a summary. And so we have asked for any spreadsheet, any document, any an analysis on which they relied. Uh, under the law, they have 20 working days to respond. And we will be flexible, but ultimately we will hold them to the law uh, in, in that regard as well. Number two, if the agency had done what we think they should have done, which was to grant our petition and commence a rulemaking, well then, as I have said with, in a previous show with you, Charles and, and Peter and Paul, the agency then should have gone out to garner the, the wisdom and gauge the temperature and learn as much as it, as it experts and others who are highly impacted, for example, by dangerous climate change by holding a number of public hearings. Here, however, they said that they're doing enough and there's no need to undertake a rulemaking, which meant that they were not going to go out and undertake those public hearings. We think that the first was a mistake and it's also a mistake, therefore, that they're not going out and listening to America. So they're not doing it. So we decided to do it to the extent that we have resources. And on November 1, in fact, we held our first public hearing on the fundamental question, what more should the United States be doing to address the climate crisis? And uh, by the way, we did invite the agency. They didn't show, but we then provided them with all of the information. And in fact, the entire public hearing is available to be reviewed by any of your any of your audience and others again at cprclimate.org. So, in addition to the lawsuit, uh, we are attempting to set the record 
that there is much more that the United States could and should be doing other than uh, implementing the recently passed Inflation Reduction Act and implementing existing rules or looking at other rules. Uh, and in addition, we are demanding that the agency prove and provide information to support their <laughs> assertion in their letter of rejection. And much of this also is discussed in the complaint which we filed uh, in federal court on uh, November 12th. So anyhow, uh, th that's probably enough background right now. I I'll just note that the way that this lawsuit we believe should proceed is that the court will itself, through expert witnesses and other testimony before the court, establish the relevant record in addition to uh, other sources of information. And it should decide the question that EPA neatly avoided in its letter of rejection. And that question is this. Do these substances, greenhouse gas pollution and fossil fuel sources from which they are derived, do they present an unreasonable risk of injury to health of the environment or not? And if they do, then the court should order the agency to commence the rulemaking that we sought in our petition in June and finally uh, begin the work that should be underway already. So anyhow, I, I hope that that's reasonably clear as a uh, background to uh, answer your, your basic question. Thank you, Dan, for that uh, response. And I'd like to hand it off to uh, Peter Carter, uh, who has a question. Yeah, and, and thanks for that very um, succinct account, Dan, of what you're doing. First of all, I want to congratulate you, Don, as, as well as Dan, in uh, continuing to push the Environmental Protection Agency of the United States to do the job that they're designed to do, and uh, with regards to uh, public safety in the future, that they have to do. And, and I see that um, Don was with the APA for uh, 30 years or more, which is about the same period of time that the um, governments, the nations of the world, have been supposedly negotiating under the 1992 United Nations Framework Climate Change Convention to ensure that we live and continue to live in a state of climate safety. And uh, of course, we're going exactly the wrong way. Emissions have never been higher and they've never increased as fast. I also want to briefly congratulate you on focusing on the real problem, the real issue, which even the IPCC really hasn't uh, got quite right. And that, of course, is atmospheric greenhouse gas pollution. Now, to me, that's crucial um, because there's no agency in the world that understands pollution better than the Environmental Protection Agency. I mean, they've been dealing with pollution for decades. They've been regulating the pollution, hazardous pollution, and they've even, they've even banned some toxic hazardous substances that have been uh, uh, distributed into the general environment. So it's really quite extraordinary that the EPA would uh, reject the claim that you're making. And um, uh, thank goodness you're pushing forward with it and, and suing them. So the question is, um, really, how did this come about? I mean, to me, it's absolutely astounding that the EPA is not doing its job and that it's actually refused, rejected your uh, absolutely accurate and more than reasonable, actually rather historic petition. So what happened here? Thanks, Peter. And, and and thanks, Paul and Charles, for giving us this opportunity. Peter, you do a much better job of, of explaining it than I do. So uh, but but I'll but I'll see what I can do. You're exactly right. Uh, TSCA is a chemical safety act and methane uh, and, and CO2 are the two most unsafe chemicals that we've ever had to deal with on this planet. So uh, I don't really understand why they would need a petition to take action against it, because Taking action against these two chemicals is exactly what Tosca was designed to do. The only two reasons that I could think of are, are hope and fear. The hope that the Clean Air Act is going to be enough to fix this. And to me, that's the definition of insanity. They keep doing the same thing and they're expecting something miraculous to happen. Uh, the other thing, too, is, is that the Clean Air Act does not reach into legacy emissions. So, I mean, clearly, 
Tosca does, and we have to use Tosca on this. Uh, as far as the other thing is fear, uh, I think bureaucrats are cautious, but I think it's a it's a misunderstanding of the word caution. The cautious thing uh, would be to address this risk, uh, not hope for the best. So I think it's those two things, hope and fear and a misunderstanding of what it means to take a cautious road. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, I just want to repeat, and um, uh, in actual fact, the IPCC has been very, very definite on this uh, very recently. The world has to stop burning fossil fuels and emitting carbon dioxide as well as methane, which, of course, now we learn is a major issue with regards to the rapid increase in natural gas. And that applies particularly um, to the United States, in fact. So the challenge is to uh, do that on an immediate basis. Global emissions have to be put in decline on an immediate basis. The um, IPCC and the, and the um, uh, chair of the IPCC has suddenly been very, very clear on that for the past several years. So on your lawsuit, um, what then is, are the specifics that you expect to achieve? There are three reasons why this lawsuit is, is so powerful. Uh, the first thing is, is that uh, it, it asks EPA to set a carbon fee. Now, a market solution is the only solution, I think, that's politically viable. And everybody uh, who supports most economists, almost, in fact, all economists, agree that it's actually setting a price is the most efficient way to reduce carbon. And, and you can do that uh, under TSCA, but you can't necessarily do it under any other law. The other thing is the legacy emission drawdown. And if we can start doing that, and we, if we can require the carbon majors to pay for their pollution, uh, it'll have some enormous effects. And the third thing is TSCA Section 13 that controls imports. Under TSCA Section 13, if any importer is out of compliance with any TSCA rule, the Treasury Department can seize their goods at the border. So if the, if the EPA would set a legacy requirement and require the carbon majors to pay down and to draw down their, their legacy carbon and require a, a set of, of progressive emission reductions, if importers did not comply with those things and they, would, they have to certify it at the border, they wouldn't be able to import to the U.S. anymore. And the U.S. is an enormous market. So we would have a, an enormous global impact just with that one thing. The other thing is, is, is that once we require legacy carbon to be drawn down, we've essentially established a shadow price for carbon because these carbon majors are not going to be able to draw it down themselves. They don't have the expertise. They're going to have to pay to do it. So that'll establish a, a shadow price. And, and I think that there's a huge equity uh, argument here that, that the southern countries and the less developed countries can make use of that of that equity because, you know, they may not have oil under their feet, but they've got the same amount of CO2 over their heads that we do. So once there's a shadow price for CO2, they can start drawing it down and they can start reaping benefits. So that's basically the short answer as to what we think is going to happen and, and what we think we can accomplish. And I'm sure, Dan, you have some additional uh, stuff that's that's even more germane. No, I think that was good. I The, the one thing I, I'll add with respect to Peter's first question and your theme of hope, Don, I think that the administration, as uh, it was seen in the debate over the Inflation Reduction Act, hoped that it could do something significant on climate and reap the political benefits of such action without unduly offending uh, vested interests, in particular the fossil fuel industry. And in fact, I see this as a fundamental mistake, not only with respect to action to date in the United States, but also action to date at the uh, international level under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change annual meetings. And we can talk about that later today or at some other time. But the Inflation Reduction Act, in fact, does not compel the shutdown of any fossil fuel power plant. Neither does it compel the shutdown of any coal mine or any oil or gas operation. It may secure some emissions reductions by making its investments into clean energy, or its investments into research and development with respect to carbon capture and sequestration or direct air capture. But all of that work aims to 
merely provide incentives and all carrots and no sticks. Our petition provides the sticks. And I just don't think that we can get either to meet the Biden administration's announced goals or more relevantly, the standard at issue in the law, which is to act until the point that the unreasonable risk from these chemicals is eliminated without forcing uh, some more systematic change in uh, the way we do business. That does not mean that under a rulemaking aimed at eliminating the unreasonable risk, there needs to be uh, substantial dislocation, economic dislocation and uh, deprivation, not at all. Uh, and as we point out in the petition, reasonable measures can be phased in uh, with an eye toward uh, protecting fundamental national security and economic requirements. Nonetheless, the pattern of action only where it will not unduly offend industry is one, I think, that puts political considerations over and above everything else, including public safety. And in part, that is because of the political stalemate that has existed in Congress and the desire to break through that stalemate with something rather than nothing. But here, with respect to Tosca, it's not a question of passing new law. Rather, it's a question of enforcing existing law. Uh, and as Justice Brennan noted uh, a number of years ago, it's the enforcement of law that really counts. Uh, and so that is what we are essentially attempting to do, enforce the statute that, that is the most germane, that provides the level of power to the agency to deal with uh, exceptionally in, intractable and dangerous problems, such as we confront with climate change. It's the statute that's fit for the purpose, but it's only useful if it's utilized. Yes, uh, thank you everybody for being here. I just want to amplify uh, some of Peter's comments about how to Peter and myself and many others, it's, it's really unfathomable to understand why what you're trying to do hasn't met with legal success because the, the US uh, EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency has a very long history um, of addressing you know, real problems, not always you know, in such a timely manner, but eventually they they come usually to the to the right kind of solution to things like if you go back four or five decades, rivers in the U.S. were catching on fire. There was the halt of rusting cars along rivers, and and uh, some of the cities were just horrendous in terms of the of the the refuse, the garbage, and and the pollution in the air and the water and. You know, the EPA um, has done a lot over the years to address these problems. You think of lead in gasoline or mercury or CFCs, dioxins, uh, you know, even things like Agent Orange and, you know, more recently forever chemicals and, you know, air pollution, you know, regulating harmful substances. So to people working within the EPA, there must be a significant number of people that are actually quite embarrassed at what their agency is doing on climate change. You know, not here we have one of the largest existential crises in the world, you know, and it, we're not, not talking about just taking out the U.S., but it's threatening life on the entire planet, not just human life, but plants and animals. So agencies like the EPA, of course, are very large agencies. And, you know, over time, there can be creep where they start making poor decisions or not the, taking the correct action, and they don't seem to recognize it themselves. So that's why I think these lawsuits are very, very important, because who's regulating the regulators? They're a very powerful agency, and what they say is... Um, very important, and they get their way usually in what they're saying, even if they're incorrect. So I think these lawsuits are very important. I mean, apart from, say, the president stepping in and saying, look, EPA, you know, wrapping them on the knuckles and saying, you've got to do your job. I mean, this is what the uh, CPR uh, initiative is trying to kind of apply the levers of the law, if you like, to, to force the EPA to, to do the correct thing now. And it hasn't happened. But I mean, you're, you're running into problems, right? 
like with the uh, the U.S. Supreme Court has ruled against these types of petitions and, and lawsuits, for example, West Virginia versus EPA, et cetera. So what is different now, I guess, is uh, you know my key question. First of all, the, the, the law at issue here, the Toxic Substances Control Act, is quite strong on this point. I'm going to read you a sentence and a half from it. Uh, this is in the context of where there's a petition to ban or restrict a certain chemical substance that is alleged to be endangering public health or the environment. If the administrator, that's the head of the EPA, denies such a petition, then the petitioner may commence a civil action, that's a lawsuit, in a federal court to compel the administrator to initiate a rulemaking. So this is what I was referring to before. And the court shall grant the petitioner a de novo hearing. That is, the court should treat the issue anew and allow the petitioner with their experts to establish the record before the, the court. And if the petitioner, and I'm here quoting again, demonstrates to the satisfaction of that court by a preponderance of the evidence, uh, that the chemical substance presents an unreasonable risk of injury to health of the environment without consideration of costs or other non-risk factors, then the court shall, so not can, but shall order the administrator to initiate the action that is the rulemaking requested by the petitioner. So Congress specified what the court should do in the event that we have proven to the court that greenhouse gas pollution and their fossil fuel uh, origins present an unreasonable risk. So that is the main answer to your question, Paul. What's different here? What's different here is the strength of the statute. Now, by the way, some of your viewers may recall that we did a whole program here on the West Virginia decision. Uh, the West Virginia uh, decision was by the Supreme Court, and the court and that there said that where there's an ambiguous statutory provision uh, that is at issue, uh, where the EPA is relying upon that to you know, undertake an action that raises major questions, including disruption of some major industry, uh, then the court will closely scrutinize uh, whether that statutory provision provides sufficient justification for the action that the agency has taken. Uh, well, and if the agency is departing from its practice uh, and has never utilized that statutory provision in such a way, uh, well, then the court will apply even greater scrutiny to the action and its it, the underlying justification. Well, here, Unlike in the West Virginia case, there is significant agency precedent. I think uh, either you, Paul, or you, Peter, noted this. That stemmed from 1978, when the uh, agency utilized this statute to commence the phase out of chlorofluorocarbons, CFCs. And they did so on the basis not only that CFCs are powerful ozone depleting substances, but also because CFCs are a powerful global warming agent. And they specified that in both the draft and the final rule. So here we, we unlike in West Virginia, we have a direct agency precedent in the utilization of this stat, these statutory provisions to get after powerful uh, greenhouse gases, in that case, CFCs. Uh, in addition, I should also mention that in 2017, the second most powerful court in the United States, the D.C. Circuit Court, established that another type of highly potent greenhouse gases, HFCs, could be regulated not under the Clean Air Act, but under the Toxic Substances Control Act. And that decision was important, not merely for what it said and not merely for the court that said it, but for the author of the majority opinion in that case called Mexichem Flor versus EPA. 
The author of that opinion was then circuit court judge Brett Kavanaugh, now on the U.S. Supreme Court. <laughs> so we have agency precedent. We have D.C. Circuit Court precedent. And then, of course, we have the clarity of the statute itself, which we review in detail in our complaint. And that basically is that under Section 6 of the statute, the agency, as I indicated, must impose requirements after determining that the chemical substances present an unreasonable risk of injury to health or the environment, must impose uh, requirements to restrict or ban those substances, it can phase it in, of course, to the extent necessary until the unreasonable risk is eliminated. So Congress has spoken clearly, we think, to this kind of a problem, and there are significant precedents. So these are the reasons why we think that even if we needed to go all the way to the Supreme Court, we could survive challenges. And in any event, Time is not on our side. We are in a crisis. This means that we can ill afford our principal federal agencies continued dalliance on the issue. The delay is in getting after these emissions and these sources is already grossly unreasonable, well beyond that. As the president himself said, both when he was a candidate, and since becoming president, we are here confronting an existential threat to the nation and to the planet. So uh, we can ill afford, in my view, failure to utilize the most powerful on-point statute to get after this problem. Well, thank you, Dan. Um, just a couple of quick follow-up things in terms of using so-called levers of the law to, to compel uh, in this case, the EPA to make the right choices in regulating greenhouse gases. Like I know there's other initiatives around the world, for example, in Sweden, you know, with Greta Thunberg um, and a whole bunch of students are suing the Swedish government, compelling them to act on climate change. Of course, James Hansen and his daughter, you know, and students have been involved in lawsuits. There's one in Canada, young people trying to compel the Canadian government to act more. So I think if this was to succeed against the EPA, I think it could be, you know, very set of historical precedents of success. And that could also lead to many more, you know, chain reaction of other people in other countries using legal means to compel their government to reduce emissions. But I guess if it doesn't work this time, you don't give up, right? You keep going and try to find other methods to attack the problem. I mean, I said that the EPA is a very sort of got this huge momentum and it's going in a certain direction and you're trying to nudge it or get it to change course on the regulation. So there's lots of other ideas, I guess you have, you know, if this doesn't work, like, I guess I'm just asking about sort of what comes next. The climate science is getting stronger and stronger. There's lots of climate attribution studies that show hey, the, the risk of these wildfires destroying the city, you know, are double or triple what they were, say, even a few decades ago, or, the, you know, your city got flooded out by torrential rains, and that's made more likely by two or three times because of climate change. So as there's more and more scientific evidence, it's really hard for the EPA to argue that they're doing enough that they're reading the risks, you know, and you keep mentioning the term unreasonable risks are not being addressed. And they're saying, well, we're doing enough to address risks, but, you know, they're not, obviously they're not as climate is worsening. Like it's not, it's not um, a, a static situation. Climate is worsening all of, all the time, very, very quickly, causing billions upon billions of more damages to infrastructure, cities, et cetera. You know, it threatens the global food supply. So, you know, I guess you just have to keep plugging away. Eventually, you're going to hit the home runs. So that's a lot. Those are uh, very good points. What I want to say is that in this lawsuit, we're trying to get at the underlying cause of this increasingly uh, dangerous uh, situation. There are a number of efforts uh, underway uh, around the country and other places in the world 
to impose a share of the damages on the one hand, uh, the highly polluting industry, on, and on the other hand, on highly polluting uh, countries. Uh, for example, one of the few good outcomes of this year's Conference of the Parties, the United Nations Climate Convention on Climate Change, was uh, the establishment of a fund for loss and damage for highly impacted nations, including low-lying uh, island nations or low-lying uh, nations like Bangladesh or countries that have been hard hit by flooding from uh, rapidly uh, melting glaciers like in Pakistan, and you know, or lawsuits intended to help compensate jurisdictions, whether uh, Honolulu or the city of Baltimore or the state of Rhode Island. These are all worthy cases seeking to impose some measure of liability for the uh, financial consequences of um, continued climate pollution and, and deception over climate change. But those really are, they're worthy, but it's like mowing the lawn. It's not getting at the underlying uh, problem. And here we are attempting to uh, in, have the agency or have the court now compel the agency to invoke or utilize the statute that is most germane so that we can get after the underlying problem, which, as Don noted, is the continuing and historical climate pollution. And we hope that not only because uh, of the potential under Section 13 of the statute to uh, utilize the market power of our nation to uh, ensure that similarly rigorous uh, action would be undertaken by our major trading partners, but also by our good example to uh, infuse the international system with more hope that something could be done. Action in the United States will not itself be sufficient, but it is necessary. Uh, we are not going to solve this problem if the world's largest historical m emitter, and still uh, among the major powers, including uh, the major emitters, including China, including India, including Great Britain, uh, we have much higher per capita emissions still. Our continued high emissions function as a deterrent for other countries to, to, to do more. Why? Because Industry in those countries or politicians will say, well, it's futile unless the major historical emitter uh, begins to accept real responsibility. So there's a number there's a number of reasons why we need to get serious in this uh, country. And if we do, there are a number of reasons why one could have some level of optimism that our good work here could be emulated or adopted uh, elsewhere. And by the way, you know, I think that if the United States gets serious, the EU will, which is already ahead of us, in my opinion, in terms of climate policy, will adopt increasingly stringent uh, provisions as well with respect to climate. And the combination of the EU and uh, the United States, and if we have continued growth of cooperative agreements with China in this area, China is extremely hard hit by uh, climate change, uh, then uh, there is a reasonable hope uh, to infuse the international system with uh, new uh, momentum. And to, you know, to be quite specific, I am eager that we should be able to have a breakthrough in this country well before COP28 uh, next year. So anyhow, uh, that's a, a bit of a long answer, but I, I think it, uh, the question merited it. What we are do, attempting to do here is necessary and perhaps could spark uh, the type of uh, revolution in climate action that is needed. I have two items uh, to mention here. First, Dan, you keep referring to the U.S. per capita emissions being the highest. I'm not sure that's technically correct, because I think Canada has a higher per capita emissions than the U.S. I think we're talking cumulative emissions here. The second item is a request to you, Dan, as follows. I was wondering if you could give us an approximate timeline on how you anticipate this case will play out over the next few months. Yeah, our cumulative per capita emissions are 
higher than China and India. We're not the highest in the world. Canada is higher than ours. Saudi Arabia is higher than ours. But among the major emitting historical nations, the United States per capita uh, emissions are, are higher. Ca Canada's emissions are important, but they are dwarfed uh, by the, uh, the total emissions, either on an annual basis or historical, that arise from the United States and China and India. If I could actually add something. Um, we actually export a lot of our emissions uh, to China, and we receive a lot of goods uh, with embedded carbon in them. And now, China's major partner, as far as ex exporting goods that have embedded uh, carbon, is, is Russia. But uh, we're almost as much, and the EU is almost as much, and we buy a lot of high-value things from China. And if we require them to certify that their goods are produced in a way that does not violate Tosca, even if we have to sort of do it in an incremental way, it would have an enormous effect. Can I just make a quick little little point, which I which has been alluded to, but it's really important. Um, I've already mentioned that this is a, a truly historic legal case, and um, uh, you described it totally accurately as a legal battle to save the world. I just want to point out that you have put out, and you need funds for the funds that you need to do the work that you definitely, definitely can do and achieve if you have enough resources. I actually want to emphasize that. The plan to save the world sounds like hyperbole, uh, but it, we, it, it actually didn't originate with us. It, it, was, uh, it was actually the title that, that the Washington Monthly, I think as Dan mentioned before, put on Dan's uh, excellent editorial. So it was in my appeal letter, so I guess I'm a plagiarizer, but, but in all fairness, I'm pretty sure that the Washington Monthly itself didn't coin the phrase. So who's the real plagiarizer? Thank you, Don and Peter. We now have the tiger by the tail. It's quite possible, although I'm not going to speculate exactly when that industry will get involved in this case. We need to develop a legal team. It can't be just me. And all of this requires resources. Now, I want to say something also about the nature of our petition and the nature of this lawsuit, if I, if I can, uh, going to your question, Charles. That timeline will be set by the court. <clears throat> but I can say that we hope to get to a full trial on the merits, if necessary, as soon as possible. But taking a step back, I, I should note that in the United States, over the last several years, in fact, the battle to protect and restore the climate system has taken a back seat to the battle to protect and restore our democratic system. Indeed, the entire United States democratic experiment, as established and refined by Washington, Adams, Jefferson, Madison, Franklin, Hamilton, and, and later Lincoln, Holmes, Jackson, Warren, Douglas, and Marshall, has been sorely tested by Trump, his co-conspirators, and his other obsequious supporters. And so one key question has been whether, and if so, when, the worst of them will finally be brought to justice. But there is another question, also critically important, even if less discussed. And that is, will our federal government, as it stands, notwithstanding continuing political division, be able actually to function to protect the people? It was just three weeks after leaving office, I think, that Jefferson, responding to his former constituents, declared for that time and forever that it is the care of human life and ha happiness and not their destruction that is the first and only legitimate object of good government. That thought rings true to me now as well as then as we consider whether our government will choose to safeguard public health from what is clearly by far the worst assault on the environment since the dawn of human civilization. Here, there is a law that can provide a strong, secure legal pathway. And that pathway was blazed by our petition that the most important environmental agency should have followed. 
Regrettably, as we've said, our Environmental Protection Agency simply chose to avoid the central question at issue in the Toxic Substances Control Act, as well as in our petition. And so now it is up to the courts, our third branch of government to decide. The stakes, I think, could not be higher. The court must determine now whether greenhouse gas pollutants and their primary sources present an unreasonable risk of injury to public health and the environment, or do they not? You know, what began as a citizen's petition is now a citizen's lawsuit. We obviously cannot do this without you, our supporters. And so we invite you to invest in, in this effort. Details are at cprclimate.org. And Charles, Peter, Paul, and Heidi, I want to thank you for this opportunity and your continuing engagement in these critical issues. Thank you, Dan and Don, for once again joining us here at the Climate Emergency Forum to update us on the progress of your vital and important work with the CPR initiative. And to our audience, if you've gotten this far in the video, we thank you and encourage you to like and share it. And if you haven't done so already, to subscribe. And we'll see you next time at the Climate Emergency Forum.